Oh, um, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Great. Okay, so I'll begin. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maeve. Uh, as Radhika has explained, um, I'm currently a senior product designer at Revolut and I'm based in London. I just relocated a month ago. And just to give like a kind of a breakdown on today's session, uh, I'll be talking, so, so there are kind of three parts. The first part will be how I got into design, my design journey so far and my experiences. And the second one would be the topic of today, which is design and business and how I think it's really important for like designers to have um, that business sense when it comes to design. And then at the end, I will keep it for Q&A so you guys can ask me uh, some questions or we can just have like a candid chat over the chat function or they can just like shout out your questions. Cool, so I will go on. So going way back to university, so I didn't study design properly, actually, actually not, not at all. Um, I actually did business in SNU back in Singapore and I thought I would end up in finance. I feel like that's kind of like the rabbit hole path that a lot of like first year business students take. You know, they want to get into finance. It sounds really cool work in a bank. It uh, turns out it's not for me at all. And during that, during that stage, I also just like found out about UX and I started like teaching myself UX um, just because it looks interesting, looks fun. And I was at that point of time, you know, I was like, okay, I'm in business school. I should just make the most out of it, right? So what I did was that from all the knowledge I've gotten from like learning like UX from like online courses, I started applying those learnings to my modules at school. So for example, I would like volunteer myself to create like visual mockups if there is, if our solution has like, if we have a digital solution and, you know, applying some kind of like process, like ensuring that whatever I'm designing, it, it is answering the original like business problem. And then outside of school, I also, you know, worked in my portfolio. Like I said, I applied like my UX learnings to like my projects and I used those in my portfolio as well. And I started applying for internships and I just never went back after that. Like it was just design internships all the way. So just a bit about my product design journey. It's definitely not very linear, there's a lot of back and forth. Um, so what I would describe my journey, I like to bring in like my favorite quote from one of my favorite Pixar movie called Soul. And in the movie, Joe, which is this guy here, he mentioned that the zone is where like souls can enter when the passions create a euphoric trance. So simply put, I've never felt this trance until I started designing. You know, um, just uh, maybe some of you can resonate, you know, when you're doing something that you love, you get into this zone where like time just fly, like just time will just fly by and like you don't notice it. So I, the first time that I noticed this was like I was in the SMU library and I was working on like a mock-up and I was back then on like Sketch or Azure RP, some outdated um, design software. And I was just designing, spending like three, four hours and I got lost in it. And I never felt that way even with my other like business modules. So this was quite a pivotal point that I knew that I wanted to do product design. So good user experience to me is something that is felt unconsciously, but created very consciously. So a good experience you would, it's usually very seamless. You don't notice that something is wrong. And usually behind that, there is like a team of engineers, designers, product owners, product managers behind that to ensure that you can get from A to B without much effort. So I wanted to be part of that creation process. So just a bit about where I started. So I started um, about four years ago, like in 2018. That was when I was in my third year of school and I chanced upon UX and I started learning more about UX, started going for like more networking sessions. For example, this kind of like talks are also something like a networking session. So good job for being here. Um, I also started working on my portfolio back then and then it landed, that helped me to land my first internship at Razor. So back at Razor, Razor is like a gaming company. They sell gaming peripherals for those that don't know Razor. And I was working on the UX, I was a UX intern on the web store where you're able to like buy like Razor laptops and like Razor peripherals from there. And subsequently I continued, like uh, I went back to school, um, worked on my portfolio and I, I uh, managed to get an internship, another internship at Shopee. And back in Shopee, I was, getting more like mobile experience. Like I said, Razor was more web. 
Um, so this was really cool. I was working on the payment and order creation flow. So, you know, if you go on Shopee, uh, you can add things to your, your, your basket and you check out. So I was part of the team that was in charge of that. And then subsequently, I um, managed to get an internship with Grab in my final semester. And I also managed to get a conversion to uh, join Grab full time after my internship there. So at Grab, I was working on the driver experience and the merchant team. So on driver experience, we were working on the driver app. And then on the merchant team, we were working on the merchant app for like delivery, for like uh, express delivery. And currently, and three years later, I. And I relocated to London for Revolut. So Revolut is a company that offers like financial solutions um, to retail customers as well as business customers. And for me, I'm working on Revolut business where we help business um, to uh, create products that can help their business grow, especially more in the financing and accounting needs. Yeah, so that is a pretty lengthy introduction about myself. I, I hope I, have, I still have everyone's attention here. Next, I'll be going on to the topic of the day, which is um, design and business and how they coexist and support each other. So this topic is quite close to me, to my heart, because I feel that as a business student um, um, who you know, went into design, um, I really learned a lot from like my design journey. Um, I do feel that having business acumen as a designer is a skill that is quite underrated. Back then when I first started out, I was just focusing on the UI, visuals. You know, I didn't really think too much about business, but after being working for like about four years in design, there is a really uh, big importance to, you know, having that kind of business sense when you're designing. And I will explain it later on. So the topic, so the first topic uh, will be about non-mainstream users and the uh, importance of designing for functionality. So you must be wondering what are non-mainstream users. So I would say non-mainstream users are users that are not like you and me. Um, for example, for the Grab platform, um, in case you guys don't know, Grab is like a right healing service. They do like food delivery as well. And one non-mainstream user would be like drivers, right? So drivers, they are they use the app um, to get jobs and how they, their dependence on the app is very different from the dependence you and I would have on the Grab platform, for example. So I would, I would say that my time in the driver team in Grab was like really meaningful one because in a sense, drivers are a user segment that is one of the least well-off user segments, but yet they have such a high dependence on the app. So it's really important that we are really solving for functionality and making sure that they, there is as little friction as possible in their usage of uh, the app. So on the right hand side, it's actually um, before COVID um, hit the fan, it was, uh, I was actually in Jakarta uh, doing a usability testing with the drivers. And here we really got to un talk to the drivers, get them to use our app and really understand what their needs are. And that, you know, in return, help us build better products for them. And the other non-mainstream user would be like, I would say food merchants. So at Grab, I was also working on the, the, the merchant team uh, where we you know, help these businesses to grow their, 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 um, like the functionality on the Grab platform. And on the picture on the right is us you know, doing a merchant interview in Jakarta. And it was really interesting. Um, this, this merchant was, um, um, Grab was his like, only kind of like way to earn money. And, his store was just really no frills on the road, you know, in the push cart, right? So um, I think this trip really got me to realize like, you know, like, um, especially these merchants, they really come from like different backgrounds and you have to really design for merchants that are from different circumstances and very different needs, right? Um, with different circumstances, it influences what they need in the product and what's important to them. And then businesses in general. So this will be kind of relating to my, um, experience in Revolut now, where we're helping businesses who are looking for products to help manage their accounting and operational financial needs um, of, a bis of the business. So, so one thing that I have, um, I feel that, that all these like users have in common is that there is a very strong functional dependence on the platform. So the flows and the interactions have to be intuitive for them to get to A to B. 
because um, any hindrance to this will not only affect um, uh, usage, like for example, like for them not using it, but the impact would be more detrimental. It could really affect their day-to-day -day operations, their earnings, uh, also depending on how like dependent they are. And let's say, for example, um, a merchant cannot upload their menu onto the grab food platform, for example. And this, if they can't get it out, they can't get it up, consumers cannot buy their food and this affects their delivery revenue. And the, uh, the usage of uh, these platforms from these users are also very closely tied to business internal metrics. So friction in usage not only affects the merchants greatly. So for example, in the case of the food delivery, they, people can't order from them, their revenue suffers, but it also affects um, the other measurements of success set by the company. So things could be like average order value or basket value, which uh, Grab as a business, they measure that as a success, right? If like um, conversion is, is right, um, uh, it, conversion is part of it. So um, this is also, so this is also like designing for these users also have a great impact on internal metrics. And the third one would be because we are solving for very functional needs, these users have very functional dependence. It's super crucial to have very strong UX logic um, behind um, your design decisions, right? The flows have to, have to be very logical and clear. And this also in turn help you to get buy-in from non-design stakeholders. So um, when we design, we have to always pitch our designs to the product people, marketing people, the CEOs, and they are coming from a non-design lens. So for them, being super logical about the flow, especially for these users are like the utmost importance, um, something that a designer must learn to be able to communicate. Cool, so we'll go on to the second topic. So previously I talked about like how important it is to get buy-in from internal stakeholders. So we'll, um, that, that leads us to the next topic, which is how having a cohesive design can help to impact uh, and influence uh, product decisions made in a company. So I would like to bring in um, this uh, example of like a design system. So design system is, um, maybe not everyone here knows what a design system is. It is a source of truth collection of reusable components used between designers and engineers. So you can imagine it like a, like a library, right? That we have all the different kinds of buttons that exist in the app. It could be like pages or buttons, for example, and everyone will be looking at this library as a source of truth. And we will always be designing and building uh, these products. So um, what's really, and also I feel like not, maybe not every designer um, have the, opportunity to work with a design system, but I would say that it's something as you go higher into design, as you get more experience, a design, a design system is something that you want to strive for um, because you don't want to spend time, all the time to like build a component from scratch, right? If we're already using it from another designer, another designer is using this button, we want to be able to um, reuse that so that we can save time on building and, and allocate more time on more strategic decisions. So when there is a design system, um, there is a shift towards more strategic design. So what this means is that, you know, when we have more like battle tested reusable components, um, that means it frees up more time for the designer to think, to do more product thinking, to, to investigate on what are the real user needs and like, will our product be used by the people that we want to design for? And a design system can also help to anchor like product decisions. So one, one good thing about having a design system is that it can influence product decisions um, in, in a way that we want to strive for consistency because we don't want to be in a situation where, um, for example, for, for Grab, um, maybe for Grab, right? We have like Grab car and also food delivery. We don't want a situation where like the, the, the colors are different on like both services, the buttons look very different. It's, it's just not consistent. And, maybe because it's not consistent, you spend more time trying to align, trying to understand like, why it's different. So when things are more cohesive, you spend less time trying to do that and you can allocate more time um, to focus on like wondering, uh, to focus more time on product thinking and product decisions. 
Um, and also, um, it's also good for the users when they have a familiar interface or they are using a product that has ha that is cohesive and very consistent. So, for example, um, like for example, familiar design patterns they also aid in usability, right? So the users, um, there's there's this kind of um, rule or principle that I like, which is recognition over recall, where users can recognize a component or a screen and they roughly know what is it, rather than them having to like remember um, what is this page used for. So having a more consistent experience can help with that recognition. And the users, they can, once they're on this page, they know what this page is used for, and it helps them to understand the interface a lot better. I really see some questions uh, on the chat. And yeah, we'll, we'll get into the, to those. And actually, that is pretty much it for my part. So um, two points, really, is just um, how, how design, um, how having like a more business-driven approach to design can help with you know internal stakeholders as well as when you're also designing for more non-mainstream users how it's really important to have the whole business in mind and like the goals of the business when um, designing for them so yeah thank you um Radhika, i think you can go into some questions if uh yep. audience have any okay so um i think um for the purpose of this talk as well it was a it was an introduction to business and design. Um, later on, we will be having more talks which um, talk a little bit more in depth um, as to what business and design really is and what it brings to the table. Um, but for now, let's go into some of the questions that we have here. Um, I think Rulin, um, you have a question. So um, would you like to unmute yourself and just um, you know ask a question? Um, Rulin Wang. Okay, um, maybe I'll just ask a question on her behalf. So um, her question is, um, do you get to do contextual inquiry often to understand the user's problems when you were in Grab and currently in Revolut? Right, um, maybe we'll in uh, contextual inquiry be more like fundamental research? Because I know that there are a few terms for it. Radhika, do you know? Um, I think maybe you can answer for like one or two of the terms. So you could give a, a response to different types of contextual inquiry as well for those who don't really know what it means also. Right. Um, so I so back in grad, like uh, we do have um, researchers that we work with. And because I think if I'm understanding right, contextual inquiry is something like fundamental research do you think that's kind yeah. of like yeah so i would say that um back in grab um we do have researchers that will help uh whenever we want to launch something new um we back in grab we will have like this uh the researchers to kind of like go to the ground and um interview users to kind of like get this new idea across to them and we see what they think to get some understanding about what they feel or if they have any like previous ex experience about this concept that we don't have any research about. And usually for designers, we can join in and we would, yeah, like from the interviews, we can understand their needs and um, pain points if it's even useful to, to build. And sometimes, you know, we find out that the, the, the users don't really care about this, this idea or this concept and then that shows that it's not really needed. So. I think um, those are some things that I did before in grad and yeah, in Revolut, I just joined, it's my second month, so I have not done it yet. Uh, so I can't comment much about that, yeah. Okay, hey, um, I think the next question is, I think it's what do they use as, or why do they use the measuring metrics? Uh, what do they use to measure metrics? So mm. it's, it's a bit vague, but I think it's about measuring the metric like the success of the product once it's launched, I'm gonna make a assumption. The assumption. So basically, how we measure metric is that um, so one metric with the food delivery example that I've been using across the whole presentation was mainly like um, checking out food or like putting food into your basket and checking and paying for it and checking out. So one metric would for that would be conversion. So 
if the user adds stuff to their basket and they don't eventually pay for it, that's not conversion. So that's one way to see if people are converting and checking out. So yeah, so that's one way that we can measure um, the conversion rate, which is a very important metric for a lot of products. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think just to elaborate a bit further, I, uh, when Maybelline means that it's like, you know, when you go on an app and you're ordering stuff, like even like if you go on Shein or like Shopee and stuff, and then putting stuff in the basket, some users don't actually um, end up checking out. They just like, okay, they'll come back to the basket and maybe order some of the time or they forget about ordering it. So that's not a su successful conversion. Um, so yeah, that, that's what it means by that measuring metrics. Yeah, and maybe just to add on a bit more, how we can use that, because if people are not checking out, it could also be a signal that, there, there could be many signals, but one signal that you can pot potentially explore would be like, would be like, is, is something breaking, right? Like, why are people not checking out? Is there like something on the interface that is preventing users from checking out? So um, these kind of uh, tracking can also shed some insight to, to what's really happening. Of course, sometimes they're not very direct, but it, it gives a bit of light on, on that, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so I think the next question is from me, which are, which is what are some tips to get buy-ins from non-designers? Like you mentioned right now, CEOs, um, you know, marketing department and other um, non-design departments. Yeah. yeah, what are some tips to get buy-in from non-designers? So. I think ultimately it's what, what I like to do is um, for marketing teams or like business teams or even teams that my product has a direct dependency on, I will usually get on a call with them and then do something called like shuttle diplomacy, which is uh, getting buy-in for them, like kind of understanding what their needs are from these calls and then also sharing them like what problem I'm trying to solve and see if I can come to a middle ground, you know, if, if, um, they're able to understand like why I'm building things that way. And usually from these calls, you're able to understand like why they're against it, you know? Like for example, in a recent project that I did, because um, um, right now in Revity, I'm working on more like financial products and they are really highly scrutinized by like like regulations from different countries. And um, we had to really fight for a buy-in from the legal team because they are like, it has to be compliant. This design is not compliant. and we had like many calls with them just to understand like what is needed, uh, what we need to show to be compliant basically. And um, and they're non-designers, right? So for them, it's like, a, oh, if, 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 if they want everything to be compliant on the design, it will look so worthy. You know, you have like terms and conditions on like every page. It's 100% compliant, but it's a bad UX. So that's when like we have to really find a middle ground with them. So. Um, I would say really understanding where they're coming from and also being open to find a middle ground. For sure, you might not be able to push for your, your best designs, but it's always about a compromise um, when it comes to your design. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let's go to um, Ewin. Sorry if I'm not getting your pronunciation correct. Um, do you want to just um, share your question? Yeah, sure. And um, thanks again right, um, right now. Um, my question is, uh, I mean, firstly, thanks so much, babe, for the talk. I absolutely agree with the need for a design system. Um, in fact, that's what we're doing at the moment, kind of refreshing our design system. Um, and I did find the, um, the book Atomic uh, Design really, really helpful in my understanding. So my question is, you know, because you're putting this out as a suggestion or a recommendation, do you think there are any scenarios where you would say a design system is not needed in a business? So far, I, I feel that, to be honest, like you, I'm also pro design system. Uh, and I feel like as a, in a business, I do think that their North Star would just be scale. Like eventually they want to scale, right? Like I don't think any business wants to just kind of remain status quo and not, not, not grow bigger. And especially when you scale and when you have many different products, there is an um, increased emphasis, uh, there's an increased importance for, for having a more cohesive design experience, right? Because you don't want like your different products to be like using different components, for example. And I do think that in this case, with the assumption that 
all businesses want to grow and scale and also value design. I do think that a, a design system should, I, I would always, um, I'm a, I'm a supporter for like design systems. So I, in my opinion, I feel like that should be always every, like what every business should, should strive for if they are very product driven, very design driven. I did not really answer your question, um, but. No, no, I think, I think you did. Know. <laughs> yeah. And I like that, you know, in answering my question, you also put in your assumptions. I think that's like really kind of like conscious and very like, kind of like a mark of a good designer. So um, thanks so much for the answer. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, okay, can we have uh, Nurbaya um, maybe ask a question? Uh, hi, thanks so much for the hi. talk. It's um, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay, so on to my question. So I just would like to ask, right, so how do you conclude that a design change is the reason for a particular business impact? Because you mentioned about uh, metrics also, right? So, but how do you draw the conclusions? Right. Do do you mean like for business impact, there could be a lot of reasons why it's happening that way? Mm, yes, correct, correct. So maybe, uh, I mean, just a very, very obvious uh, example is that, oh, let's say in this website, there's no hero, uh, in this web, uh, hero, right? There's no uh, call to actions, but after you implement the call to actions, then there's increase in, um, you know, there's increase in uh, signups. Yeah, but then for uh, things that is less obvious, so how do you like draw the conclusions? Mm. Do, you have, do you have an example of something that is less obvious? Um, actually, not so much, but rather, you know, like in the business, there they could be reason or maybe um, it could be because of the marketing effort. It could be because of your design change. It could be because... Uh, you know, it's the trend right now. So, yeah, that's like, there are so many factors, but how do you like, you know, inform the stakeholders? Like actually, the reason why, um, you know, uh, there's an increase in this particular signups or asset is because of the design change. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. The answer is, in my experience, I don't think there's ever been a very direct conclusion that something is failing um, because of design or because of like something else, because I, for sure for, for the, the success, the, the success of a product is always a team effort, right? There's always like, um, there's a lot of reasons. We can try our best to make an educated guess on what's breaking. Um, but there can never be like a, a like an immediate answer. I'm trying to think of an example where on an interface, like if something is, is well like one example that i had um is a quite a simple example uh was uh on the driver team um i think we wanted to get <clears throat> we wanted to get more um tips for the drivers on the driver app oh uh, so, sorry we want to get more tips for the driver and what we did was that we we introduced like a additional like entry point uh or a, or a tipping component on the on the customer facing the uh, app so that they're able to give a tip for the driver when the driver is on the way to delivering their food so for that it is a simple example but because of that component and our tracking we were able to see a sharp increase in tips right that, that are given to the drivers so i feel that when it comes to more interface related um kind of adjustments or changes the it will be and, and when it's also tied to a very clear metric like for example the metric here would be increased in driver tips so in that case you can really make that strong conclusion that um actually you know what like um this is caused by by this additional component so yeah i think so far like i think this has been um as long as the as long that's why it's also really important when you are designing to always set very clear metrics so they're able to when you launch it you see the metric and you can it informs you about the effectiveness of a design. So um, it's just, I would say there's no clear answer, but it's just kind of like the due diligence that you do in the product stage and when you're designing and then making educated assumptions after that. Yeah. Thank you so much for answering. No worries. 
thanks a lot for that question. I think that was quite a tough question to answer, but it was also a really interesting question. Um, okay, let's move on to uh, Vikraman. Uh, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, uh, thanks, Rika. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Mevlin, for this uh, wonderful talk. Yeah, and uh, my question is about uh, when you're bringing a disruptive innovation into a business, like say uh, AI or 5G and all that, how do you integrate uh, business value into the design part? Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, because I work in the innovation space, that's why I asked a very innovation related question. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do we integrate business value? Do you mean like the design part of the disruptive innovation? Yeah. So, like when you justify to the management and all that, right? Uh, what value it brings to the, to the, com the company and all. Yeah. Do you mean, do you, what value does does the yeah, innovation bring it, or it, the, it, yeah, like the, the the part that if you're building an AI component into your your business and all that, right? So how do that uh, you you definitely have to justify how does it lead to some some kind of change or like um, in in some sense uh, there's going to be cus customer improvement and all that, right? Um, I'm not too sure i don't think this is a design only question it feels like a like a very like high level like if we are like how how do we bring business value into any kind of ideas or innovation that we bring in um mm -hmm. and um i think first of all there should be the business should recognize that there is a need for this innovation and we're not just doing this innovation because we are doing it because other competitors are doing it or because it's a trend. Um, the business needs to see that there's value. And I think that we also need to see the cost of building this, right? So some ideas, it's, it sounds really good, but the cost is way higher than the reward, right? The ROI doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And then that's when that would assess that the business would be like, it's, it's interesting, but for now priorities, we don't have the resources to do this right now. So I think it's really about trying to bring in the value and also communicate the cost because everything mm. has a cost, right? Yeah, it, right, it will right. only make sense if, if the cost is, if the value is higher than the cost and then that's mm. when you go ahead with it. So yeah, I think, I think this question is quite, quite um, broad, broad, not yeah, just yeah. like design, yeah, but, but, it's a, but, yeah, but it's also important to think about it as a designer because there are some times when you design something and is it's just technically too expensive. So for example, mm. um, engineers would be like, oh, why not just, why should we build this component from scratch when we already have this other component that does the exact same thing? Mm. And can, can we reuse that, right? So that's yeah. a, a conversation that you need to have. It's almost like cost and reward, right? It's the same yeah. concept. Do you have any so, like, yeah. ex experience, like, um, like your personal experience in your, uh, in so, so far of your design career that, you face that kind of situation all the time i face it okay. even now <laughs> okay yeah okay. <laughs> so i mean it's, it's always kind of like you you when it, when i'm designing i always have two versions like one is i design like for the the best ux like if we have all the resources in the world we go for this ideal version mm -hmm. and then i have another version which is like a backup plan right like if if i cannot get what i want what is the next best option and that is something that and that helps with negotiating as well because yeah. if the person feels that you're only going head on with just one option and there's no room there's no wiggle room i think that also affects like the rapport and the working the working relationship and i think so far that helps like understanding why we can't do the best version what is like the next good enough version that ultimately solves the same problem for the users because always um the users are always the priority, right? Like both versions, is a, it is still a workable solution. It's just that maybe one version is just a bit more, has a bit more finesse. It looks a bit better, looks better. Yeah, so there's always like, uh, you have to always uh, come um, to an in-between with like who you're talking to, yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, I think I can yeah. re totally relate because I work in the innovation space, so I, I know what these issues. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yep, no worries. Thanks for your question. Um, okay, let's move on to Anne-Marie. 
Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Maeve. Uh, thanks for your sharing as well. Um, just wondering, so like, um, because I think you mentioned like, um, business strategy as well as like, um, like strategic design. So I think that mm. kind of like, um, just out of curiosity, like how much time, like, like, for example, like maybe during your daily work, do you like spend on like such like long-term thinking, like whether it's like a building on components or like long-term strategy versus like your more immediate tasks, like, um, like maybe problem solving or building for your, like a certain functionality, for example. And also like, is it something that you have to sort of like consciously, um, set aside time to do like, okay, I think I need to set a certain percentage of my time for strategic thinking. Yeah. I think that that was what I was curious about. Yeah. Um, I would say that now, um, especially if you, I would say I prefer spending, I, I generally like spending more time in the product thinking phase. Mm. Um, especially when, if you have a design system already, you don't really have to come up with the components yourself. It's all about like strategically placing the components in your flows and making sure that it's intuitive. So I think that part, it takes less time uh, because if you already have a design system, you can just plug and play the components. So this is, I'm kind of explaining um, under the assumption that like there is a design system that works and therefore I have the luxury of time to mm. spend more time on product thinking. I know not every designer will have that and it's totally understandable. Design systems take, take a lot of time to build. It's also very expensive and it takes a, like, could be years to like get one that's really working. Um, but I, I would say as much as you can, I feel that product thinking is also um, super important to ensure that you're building the right product. Um, and then how you build it is like how you build, how you make the product right, right? So I always feel like the beginning, once you get that right, almost half the battle is won, you know, mm -hmm. um, making sure that, um, like what kind of user needs you are, you are, um, you are uh, solving for and also cost, right? Like what does this cost the business? What are the metrics to measure the success? Um, scoping out the requirements on what you should build. And then once that is done, I feel that design would like design would also be more narrow and that like, you kind of know what to build and you always have this plan to anchor your designs back. And this is especially really useful um, for when you're presenting to like, um, like bigger stakeholders, where they will always question you about the rationale, the cost. And once you have, once, because you spend more time on this, you're able to un have those questions, uh, sorry, have those answers to those questions. So for me, in my experience, um, I started focusing on product thinking, not from the start for sure, like it's something that I've learned and tried and error. And I feel that it has worked so far, it has worked well for me so far. Um, just spending a little bit more time on the um, on the product thinking speech. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah. Thanks. I hope that answered your question, Emery. Yeah, it did. Um, yeah. A lot of insights from her answer. Yeah. Okay. We have a few more questions. Um, Charmaine. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. This is isn't really super design related. Just interested because I think your. Um, work experience was quite interesting. So I, especially like heading down to speak directly to the merchants and they are such a different group of users, right? Mm. So what was like the most um interesting insight, maybe the most surprising that you found just by speaking to them directly or having them use your product? Yeah. So I remember there was this one merchant. Um, we were doing like a usability testing, which is that we are like, showing them an app and then like with a prototype and then they were just going through the prototype and we just see what they think about it. So after talking to this merchant, um, okay, maybe just a bit of context. Uh, um, when Grab Foods first started out, merchants were on this, um, were on this model called, um, our concierge model where actually drivers have to go to the restaurant, buy the food manually and then deliver it to you. This, this model, as far as I know, has already been obsolete. Like now we, now it's kind of like integrated. So whenever you, whenever you order, the, the order goes directly to the merchant. So the driver just, you don't have to order it. They just go like be on the way to the restaurant and they pick up the order. So basically that were, there were two kind of models and um, the, the merchant that we we're talking to, uh, they actually had, because of this kind of, migration issue like because we had two models um on the on the on the on the consumer who's using the app they see like two merchants of the same merchant basically one it's 
for the previous model where like the driver goes to the shop and like buys the food. And then the other um, listing is just like a normal updated model. So the, the, the merchant was like, oh, like sometimes um, uh, I get like drivers like, and, and just so happened, I think the merchant was only using one, um, uh, one, one of the model. So there were like drivers who come in and be like, oh, I want to buy this food for this merchant, but they had no idea like where this order is coming from. So I think that's quite interesting. Like, like, uh, if we, like the, the merchant just didn't know, like that their listing is posted twice, uh, from the users. And, um, I thought that was like quite, yeah, like it's, it's just, it sounds stupid, but like it happens, you know, like all these kind of like each cases happen and. Mm -hmm. You really cannot imagine like a scenario like that would happen if you're just at your desk and designing for like users. It's something that you really go on, you go to the go to the users and they will like come and complain to you, oh, this app is like not doing well. And then you kind of get all these insights. So which is what I really like about Grab actually is that we have very, we had a we have a very strong research presence. Like um like they really value research there and and really connecting with the users. So actually Radhika, she used to be a, a UX a researcher at a uh, intern at grad. So yeah, she, she also knows what I'm talking about. I hope. Yeah, no, no. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I was doing service design there for a bit and I was working on grab kitchen. So yeah, we, I mean, uh, grab kitchen was expanded to Southeast Asia and we did go down to multiple countries uh, or cities to actually do research with the teams there um, to talk to them to find out what their problems are. And I think just to add on to what Maeve was saying, uh, sometimes consumers or people will not respond direct. They will respond to your um, your questions, but your their, the answers you're looking for might not be in that. You have to keep talking to them. You have to keep digging deeper. And then you'll find out the real insight that you need, which is like the gold that you're looking for. It might not be on the surface. So it's really important to put yourself in their shoes um, and see from their perspective. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing. Okay, um, wow, um, a lot of questions <clears throat> lining up. Okay, I'm just going to take the next few questions. Let's try to finish it up. Um, we have a question by Paul. Um, hi, yeah, hi, uh, Maybelline. Uh, Everyone, um, yeah, I'm Paul. I'm a new um, product designer working in the healthcare space. So very new and just uh, three months in my job. Previously, I was a graphic designer. So as a graphic designer, we have to finish everything perfect before we publish. But now I'm having like a huge culture shock. Um, so yeah, I just want to understand more about, uh, you know, um, your, the, your, your work process firstly like just very briefly um i'm just wondering like because you've been in a few companies like uh how those environments like determine your work process is it same or different and secondly how are ux team organized in the various companies you work in and what are the differences um because i work in a startup setup and um and I think um, the other product designer, um, I mean, um, we are still like, we are kind of like, uh, anyway, I, uh, we are uh, quite a young team. So we are like, um, you know, try to um, figure out uh, uh, the best way to work uh, together. Um, and, um, and, also, and, you know, with the other stakeholders as well. So which is why I'm also curious to find out like what are you know what's happening in other companies uh, and um like or maybe just in general not only specific um and then thirdly like um so what is the career progression of a product designer because like sometimes i i look is uh junior then senior then after that not very clear um and um yeah thanks cool. thank you for the question uh yeah i think the the work process um, how I, I mean, it's definitely evolving. Um, I would say maybe at the start, I had, don't really have a lot of process because I was just also figuring out what works for me. Um, but these days I more or less have a process. Um, uh, usually when I, I when I get a, a brief from, or like the problem, right? 
what I'll do is I like to get into like, so I, I, I have two kind of stages in my head. It's like product thinking and then um, the visual design, which is like really like getting into the pixel perfect screens. So in product thinking, you have the problem. What I, what I like to do is that really understanding what are the key problems, um, who are the users that you're solving it for. And then um, I like to also do something like, it's called how might we, for example, it's like, oh, like how might we educate business uh, businesses that they can withdraw funds of uh, for one just to kind of frame your thoughts um and always document it i find that when you document it you write it down you can share it with like it's also good for to to trigger like discussions with other people so that's the first thing that i do like on my figma i just have like these um product thinking uh prompts um and I think like you said, like as a visual designer back then, you always have to like present something perfect. Right? There's always that kind of, uh, um, kind of like uh, inclination, but with product design, yeah, it's, it's really about, you, um, especially if it's something of, something that is very complex, right? Um, usually I would just be, op you have to be, you have to try to be open to be share to be sharing like really scrappy designs. They don't even need to be like perfect designs because if it's a very complex solution, it's a it's a big problem. You don't want to spend too much time into a wrong direction, right? If you if you put in all your resources into a flow that actually doesn't make sense, you'll be just wasting time and then coming back to 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 redo again. So usually usually depending on the scope, if it's a very big scope, I would just have like wireframes, like very 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 like um, scrappy wireframes to just show the idea, get feedback. And then also go through like the kind of product thinking with the people that I want to get feedback from and get the feedback and then change the designs again, work on the designs again until you have you you, are, you know that you're really solving for the right the right problem and you have more or less the, the solutions for it. So this is my step. And then once you have the, the rough solutions, that's when you go into like visual design, where it's like the components, the interaction, um, the, the illustrations. Uh, so that's kind of like my work process that answers the first question how are ux teams organized in various companies in, that i work in to be honest i don't have a lot of experience in working in startups um maybe small design yeah actually no design teams that work like a startup yes because when i was at like razor um i was the second design person i was the, the second ux person um in terms of the the, the web store so my team was very small, so it's quite, I wouldn't say like a startup, but like within the team is a bit startup-ish. Um, uh, but generally, I don't, I would say I don't have, really have a lot of experience on like working in smaller design teams. In Shopee, Grab, Revolut, they're all pretty big. So I would say that um, in Grab, we have visual designers working on illustrations, um, product designers, and sometimes product designers, they have to do visual work as well, like graphic, like illustrations. So Grab was was like that. Currently in Revolut, product designers don't touch visuals at all, like in terms of illustrations, animation, motion design. We have like designers just for that. So that is how it's currently structured in my company now. Yeah, a bit more separated. Maybe we have, we have more resources, yeah. So what is a com common career progression? Uh, usually junior designer, senior designer, lead designer, um, and and then you can kind of choose to be an IC, go the IC, and then you're kind of like two tracks. It's either an IC track, which is an individual contributor track, or a manager track. So you can kind of like proceed on and level up in the IC route, or you can, you know, pivot and be like, okay, I want to do, I want to do the manager route, and then level in that route. So I would say that the levels are the same, but the scope is very different. So you can continue to be an IC and be also the same grade as a as a manager. That's also fine. Yeah, in, in most big companies, that's kind of like the structure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I think we have two, three questions left. Um, just to let everyone know, I think we might overrun by five minutes or so, but do stay on if you want to, um, you know, um, learn a little bit more. Um, so, Rulin, I'm not sure if we're able to unmute your microphone now. Um, you should be able okay. to unmute it. Yeah. No. Um, okay. It's fine. I think Rulin, I'll just, oh yeah, I saw you. 
you were there. But are you unable to unmute? Otherwise, it's fine. I'm just going to share a question with me, Willin. So um, question is, from what you mentioned in Grab, research and design are split between two teams. Is it the same structure in Revolut? Could you share your process to join Revolut? I think you did share a little bit about the first question, Neve, which is the structure in Revolut. And then the second question is um, your process to join Revolut. Yeah, uh, I would say that the, the, the research team is um, more, is, so in Revolut, we also have a research team as well. But I would say that it's, it's, a, it's a very new team. Uh, we just kind of hired like a head of research like late last year, this year. So I would say that um, the structure is similar where we have researchers and uh, uh, product researchers and product designers separate. Um, but it's just that in, in Grab, like we have, we've had, we have had like researchers way earlier on and they've been like really, um, very experienced in, in the field. Um, so, so it's the same structure, I would say, um, share your process to join Revolut. Um, to be honest, it was why I joined Revolut was because I wanted to, it's always been my dream to move abroad for work. So it wasn't like I wanted to join my ability. It was just kind of, it just so happened. Um, I was like open to opportunities and like it just came and I, I took it. Yeah. So yeah, that was, that was the process. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think uh, Rulin's next question is, do you prepare uh, CGM, which is customer journey map and user flow as a product designer? Um, it, so it depends. I don't do it for all projects, um, especially for smaller projects where the context is already very clear. I really know what I'm um, what I'm solving for. But for more uh, flows that are, that are more complex, or maybe there wasn't work done before. You know, maybe it's a totally new flow that never existed before. So I I just want to understand more about ma making sure that I cover all points and I I don't miss out any like edge cases or anything. Um, that's when I will do a more elaborate, like user flow, a user journey, and um, yeah, point out moments where like you could, uh, we could, you know, fix or any kind of problems. So I would say that I don't do it all the time. It's only for when I don't have a lot of context or uh, it's, it's something very complex and new. Then I'll do a, something a bit more elaborate uh, in terms of the planning. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. Last question. Um, yep. Yeah, um, Andrea, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Mifalin. I was just wondering, are there any frameworks you would recommend to use when prioritizing the change, the design changes to be made to a product? Or like, how do you and your team usually prioritize us? Uh, which changes should be like rolled out first? Yeah, uh, this is a, a good question. Um, it's, it's very often where in a project, you know, everyone is they get overly excited and they want to include like all the cool features and you, the project suddenly becomes like super big and hard to tackle. Uh, what I like to do is that I like to split like designs of features into like must-haves and good to have. So the must-haves would be in, would be making sure that what is what is considered done for a user in this flow, right? For example, if we are looking to for users to check out in the experience, that is a must-have and all the steps and the flows for helping a user check out, they have to, we, we must build them, we must prioritize them. And then maybe something that is a good to have could be like, oh, Apple Pay integration, or like um, we, we integrate with Samsung Pay. So that is like a good to have, you know, as long as we provide a way to include their credit card details to pay, as long as they can get through that flow, they can, that is considered as done. So um, this is what I like to do is to just like, the features that we must do. If we don't have these features, the user cannot complete the flow. And then the good to have would be maybe like extra touches that would make it a bit more intuitive, would make it more convenient. Uh, then those are prioritized uh, before the must haves. And this really helps uh, to just narrow down the scope and make it a bit more um, like, like easier to tackle basically, yeah. Okay. Oh, got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks a lot. Um, I think, yeah, Maybelline, you deserve a glass of water. 
um, thanks for everyone's questions. I think um, all of us got to learn a lot, um, you know, from the talk as well as the um, Q and A session. Um, thanks, Maybelline as well. Um, I think we'd quickly just like to switch screen to back to redesign people um, as a closure. So, please, if you could just take it away. Just give us two minutes more. Yeah, uh, full screen, please. So I think just to end, um, we're actually going to have our, the next thing we're going to have on our plate is our community get together. Um, and that's going to be happening very soon, probably end August or beginning September. So we look forward to having everyone on board um, just to get to know each other, you know, network a little bit. Um, just grab a beer or something and just, you know, have a good chat. Um, so, the next page. So, in order to, you know, um, make sure that you're following us and you keep up with what's happening. Steve, can you go to the next page, please? Yeah. Do follow us on our Slack channel. We've also put the links um, in the comments section below, um, as well as our Instagram page. So, Pick whichever, follow us um, on either channel uh, just to stay in touch with us um, and look forward to um, the rest of our talks and workshops as well. Yep. Uh, the links are in the uh, page below as well. And uh, yeah, we will email them to you as well. So not to worry about that. 